Okay, I am. Uh, you can hear me? Okay, I feel better now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate you, Megan. Yeah, bye. So do we have everybody here for the meeting that should be? It looks like um, there are only three board members on right at the moment. Okay. I know I spoke with Deb and Van and they were both planning on coming on. So maybe I'll see if they're having trouble. Well, thanks, Megan. <laughs>
I think Brad Wagner also should be here too, right? I, I know that we sent him an invitation to make sure that he could join if he wanted to. I, I don't think he um, is officially appointed yet, but. Oh, yeah, that's right. Sonny Board hasn't approved it. Right. We did have committee on committees, but not. Wait, I'm confused. Brad is appointed here too. Don't we already have sure. all the places filled? Um. <laughs> you want to talk on that, Peg? Or no, I didn't know if you wanted me to or not. No, uh, it's, it's Brad, up to you. Yeah. No. No. Sure. That's fine. Uh, we no, were, the situation better than I do. Yeah, Brad and I were both were both on the committee too of the fair board, and we were sitting there when nobody else was there one time, and and I was telling him I was on my fourth meeting of the of three days, and he said what, and I said yeah, and I said, he said well, how many committees are you on? I said five, and I said well how many are you on? He said two, and I said hey you want one of mine? And I was just kidding, but he said yeah I'll take it. I'll take it. I said seriously I said I don't know if we can do this but if we can and you want to take it I think you're more than qualified because I'm doing a lot of mental health work here with my husband who has severe PTSD mm -hmm. and it was kind of a load lifted to be truthful but I thought mm -hmm. I had learned so much on, on this board and so uh, he said that he would take over and I thought if he'd like to I'm going to so this is what happened <laughs> okay so then it went to committee on committees and it's going yeah, it's going to. And he thought he might join this meeting. But um, yeah, he's, um, he wants to, to take over. And of course, there's also I told him, I said, well, there's a catch to that. I said, there's also a nutrition thing that is attached to this. So I don't know what they're doing with that. One person on health and human service has to be on the nutrition board. Mm -hmm. And I told him it's an interesting board. It's very, I, I said, I've only been to one meeting, but I said, it's really quite interesting. So that board will also I see that's on our agenda today. Um, but yeah, he and I thought my husband, PTSD and I'm really dealing with a lot of this right now and so I'm still on three big committees I'm on the fair and I'm on the, the um, I'm on uh, Pine Valley the fair and I've got the housing so I've got three now and he's probably got three too so <laughs> and he just didn't have as many because he was off the board then he came back on so he seemed very interested and uh, I thought as much as I mean I enjoyed this board I but it's 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 a lot but um He's taking, he's going to, uh, he, if it's approved, he will take over. And I said, if it's not, then that's fine. I said, I'll stay on the board. But uh, I think it's a good opportunity for him as well to be on another committee. Yeah. So that's that's the issue that we've got. So Carrie, <laughs> it does. how does that work then? Does, when does committee on committees meet? Is it before a county board meeting or did they already meet? We yeah. have already met and made an appointment for Brad. Okay. So it just needs to go on the county board for approval. Okay. So he should be able to be appointed then by next meeting? Tuesday night. Okay. And our citizen member too was also appointed. So. And I didn't put on anything regarding uh, reassignments of our subcommittees until next month when everyone's at the table, every all that transition happens. So um, what's on the agenda for today is actually, I believe a citizen member for the nutrition program. Oh. <clears throat> and well, Angie and Tracy. 
Well, it looks like we have a quorum, don't we? Yep. So I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting order. Was there a posting of this meeting properly posted? Yes. Yep. And I would entertain a motion to approve a 19 point agenda. All right, so move. Second. Motion by Mr. Nelson, seconded by Ingrid? Yeah. Any discussion on the agenda? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carrying. Approve our August 13th, 2020 Health and Human Services Board Minutes. Is there any additions or corrections? Hearing none, I'll declare that those minutes are approved as presented. Citizen comments. Is there, is there anybody from the public or any staff members or county board members that want to speak about something regarding health and human services that's not on the agenda? All right, we'll move on to agenda item number four. Or election of officer, the vice chair. Marty was filling that position, but Marty stepped down from Health and Human Services Board, so left a vacancy in the position of vice chair. Vice chair can be a citizen member as long as the majority of board members, as long as there's a majority of county board members, there can be a citizen member as a vice chair. Are there any nominations or recommendations? Vice Chair? I would like to nominate Ingrid Glassbrenner for Vice Chair. And I'd second that. We have a motion and a second to nominate Ingrid Glassbrenner as the Vice Chair of Health and Human Services. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? I move the nominations be closed in unanimous ballot cast for Ms. Glassburner. Yeah. Got a motion by Mr. Nelson to close nominations and cast a unanimous ballot for Ingrid Glassburner as Vice Chair of Health and Human Services. There is a second by Peg Call. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Congratulations, Ingrid. Move on to agenda item number five, Health and Human Services Citizen Board Member Recommendations. Has, has there been people that asked to be on there? Um, Carrie, no. There, there is, her name is Cindy Chicker. She was the she just retired as vice president of operations at the Richland Hospital. I'm not sure I got her title right. Is but, she uh, here today? What's that? Is she here today? I don't see her mm -hmm. on here. No, I didn't include her um, on the, the mail out. Okay. But I mean, what, what do we need to do just to prove it? Because that's the only recommendation, correct? Or only when we had? I don't think we we uh, approved recommendations. I think it's the administrator's responsibility per statute to yeah. appoint a Health and Human Services Board member to the Health and Human Services Board. I think what this is is just an in, information only. You know, but Cindy, I've known Cindy for a little while. I went to school with her daughters and her son, but uh, her husband was the former police chief of Richland Center Police Department years ago, and she is involved with Like the Pine Group in Richland County, and she's a member of Richland County Parks Commission, which I also chair that, so I've known Cindy through there also. Yeah, 
Yeah, I've known her through my work at the hospital. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, she's excellent. So I'm excited to have her join. Wonderful. So we'll move on to agenda item number six, the uh, director's report. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we began our uh, new office hours this week. Uh, we're now open 8 to 4.30 Monday through Friday. Uh, this helps us to accommodate some staffing issues and puts us more in line with uh, the courthouse uh, uh, departments with their office hours. Services will continue to be provided outside of the regular business hours in order to accommodate uh, needs of those we serve uh, that will uh, keep going as we have before. Uh, with the ADRC, our ADRC is participating on a work group uh, to bring Project Lifesaver to our community. Uh, Project Lifesaver is a search and rescue program operated by public safety agencies. Uh, it's designated for at-risk individuals who are prone to life-threatening behavior of wandering. The primary mission of Project Lifesaver is to provide timely response to save lives and reduce potential injury for adults and children uh, who have the propensity to wander due to a cognitive disability or cognitive condition. Uh, the ADRC will use funding received from the regional office to help purchase transmitters for this program. The ADRC is also getting ready for this year's Medicare open enrollment season, which goes uh, from October 15th to December 7th. So this is the time that people should uh, review their current Medicare Part D plans or their drug plans and make any changes needed. Our elder benefits specialist is available to assist individuals with this process. In uh, economic support, uh, to give you an idea of the economic impact of the pandemic on Richland County residents, in the last six months, um, comparing August uh, to last March of 2020, uh, there was almost a 21% increase in food share recipients and 8.5% uh, increase in healthcare recipients. Uh, also, the uh, new WEEP season is upon us. That's the Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program. Uh, the next couple of months will uh, be busy as we begin to take applications again. Uh, this year, there's an online application option in addition to applying here at the office. Uh, households can remain safe and healthy and not have to come into the office for paper applications if they don't want to. Uh, also related to WEEP, uh, six households in Richland County have received rental assistance through RAP, that's W-R-A-P, totaling $8,700. RAP, or the Wisconsin Rental Assistance Program, is administered by Southwest CAP and is tied to being eligible for WEEP. The Richland Area Child Care Task Force continues to gather parent surveys um, and responses in an attempt to understand the needs for child care in Richland County and how the community response could help. The task force is hoping to build uh, support networks for providers as well as to help them stay in business uh, for the parents' sake. In our Behavioral Health Services Unit, uh, the Birth to Three program is completing the transition to CESA 3 for our um, occupational therapy and uh, physical therapy for families over the next few weeks. Um, they have worked with the hospital therapy services, which is ending in order to assure good continuity of care. September is Suicide Prevention Month. Uh, in Wisconsin, the suicide rate increased 40% uh, between 2000 and 2017. And in 2019, 850 individuals were known to have died by suicide in Wisconsin. 
the Behavioral Health Unit is working with Joanne Krulotz at WRCO to provide a story on the radio uh, this month related to suicide prevention and awareness. So far in 2020, our Health and Human Services crisis staff uh, have provided assessment and follow-up services to 285 individuals who have either experienced suicidal thoughts or some other type of emotional crisis. Our Health and Human Services is again providing a therapist to work at the Richland School District to provide uh, mental health services. In addition to providing services to the students, uh, the therapist is training school staff in using the source of strength model. Uh, this is an evidence-based uh, practice that has been shown to reduce youth suicide through focusing on adult youth connectedness, increasing peer leadership roles in schools, and through increasing positive perceptions and acceptance of youth who are seeking help. Also in behavioral health, the intensive outpatient uh, substance abuse program will begin group work next week uh, for adults coping with opioid use disorders. Excuse me. In our child and youth services, uh, Wisconsin uh, has selected an assessment tool called the Youth Assessment and Screening Instrument uh, for statewide youth. This is also, excuse me, this is also referred to as the YAZI. The tool guides case planning by indicating which areas or risk factors may be the best targets for intervention for individuals involved in the youth justice system. Our child and youth services staff will begin training and implementation of the YAZI this month. Uh, the implementation of this tool is expected to take place over the next uh, six months. And with the school year starting, uh, we're preparing for increased reports in abuse and neglect and truancy. Increased reporting often occurs when children and youth return to school and have more contact with mandated reporters who are trained to identify concerns. With so many different educational arrangements in the schools, uh, staff may be responding more to family homes uh, for those students receiving virtual instead of in-school education. For safety reasons, uh, law enforcement typically accompanies our staff when they go into residences. And as always during this pandemic, uh, all of our services continue to be provided through a combination of in-person contacts and by virtual means using the telephone, video contacts, telehealth, uh, based on whatever is most appropriate and safest for all individuals. And that's my report. Uh, I do have some information uh, that maybe I can put up on the screen as Rose gives the health officer's report just on um, some recent uh, data on our cases in Richland County. Thank you so much. Um, in Richland County, and this data is, um, um, is current in part as of yesterday afternoon, but also as of this morning, um, we now have 63 positive cases of COVID in Richland County. We have had 3,730 negative tests. We currently have 14 active cases, 45 individuals have been released from isolation, five individuals have been hospitalized, and we have suffered four deaths. So that's kind of uh, a snapshot of, of where we're at um, um, as of yesterday afternoon into this morning. Um, very few days go by anymore when we don't have at least one, two, or more positive cases, and then uh, contact tracing commences. And it can, that can be a daunting task depending on the, the different types of um, um, activities that our, our, our positive um, individuals have been engaged in. So that can really take a lot of time to do. And then all of those individuals are set up for symptom monitoring for at least 14 days, if not longer, depending on their relationship and their contacts with the positive cases. So we're staying very busy. Um, we're, uh, we've done a lot of planning with the school districts, um, hoping that we can maybe avoid some of what we've been seeing 
at, at other um, institutions of learning. So it's uh, been, it's very busy. And as you can probably tell, the phones just don't stop either. So um, at any given point, I've got several waiting for me. So we remain very busy. We have not had any, there's been no decrease in the activity here in Richland County. Our test uh, levels do not rival those of our collar counties. However, um, it's significant enough given how we are staffed and, um, and given the impact that it has uh, in the community in work sites um, and in, in schools and the like. So yeah, um, things have not, have, uh, COVID has not taken a holiday in any regard here in Richland County. Is there any questions or concerns for Rose or Tracy? How severe of cases are you seeing Rose? When you say the word severe, are you acting? Are you asking about symptoms? Symptoms where people need to be hospitalized. Um, we haven't seen a hospitalization for a while. I'll be honest, but there have been some very, very sick individuals. Um, we screen for approximately 15 symptoms, and some people have that and more. It's incredible, and I know that waxes and wanes from day to day, but yeah, we've had some very, very ill individuals. However, they're able to manage to recover successfully at home. Um, a lot of that has to do with uh, their health prior to becoming infected. So yeah, we've seen some really sick folks. We haven't, we've seen, um, we've had folks that have been mildly symptomatic. Um, you get an occasional person who has little or no symptom. Um, but yeah, we've had some really sick individuals and that seems to occur regardless of age. Um, um, a lot of younger individuals in the state of Wisconsin, that's kind of been the highest proportion of folks who have been uh, affected. And we're seeing that same trajectory here. Um, yeah, I hear you. That's Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, when you say that Bill Rose, um, based on numbers, our hospitalizations are, are down, correct? You said we haven't had a hospitalization in a while. And I believe those four deaths, that was from early on. Is that That's correct? Four. Yep, those were, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, and I also wanted to say, um, Rose, I saw your, uh, I'm sorry, it's just a slightly off agenda, but I just wanted to say congratulations on your article in uh, Richland Observer. It was very nice. Well, um, yeah, I, that's kind of the, the last thing that I <laughs> prefer to be. But, I'm sorry to embarrass you. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah, when, when folks reach out and ask you to, to participate in that, you, you kind of feel like you're, there's, there's a bit of an obligation. Otherwise, I'd rather, my life isn't that exciting where it would ever be that newsworthy. So, but thank mm. you. Yeah. What are the demographics that we're looking at? Um, is it all over the board from from elderly in their 80s 90s down to infants we have, seen, we have seen children uh, between 0 and 10 be confirmed cases we've seen folks 90 and above be confirmed cases so we have seen uh, the age range through the entire continuum of um of um people's ages so yeah i can honestly say that yep we've seen folks between zero and ten be positive we've seen people 90 to above be positive so we've seen it all and contract monitoring that's been going okay if the people that have been infected with covid19 have they been in contact with other people that have had covid19 are they getting it somewhere out in public or we, um, I'd say the vast majority have had uh, an identified contact, but we do have some that we have no idea where they got it for a fact. Some folks are, are um, we sometimes get folks that even, I've even had people self-report the fact that they tested positive. Uh, there are different avenues for folks to get tested and there's different time frames for getting the uh, results back. And I've even had folks call me saying, yes, I got results back from a test site or whatever. Um, and it was maybe not the usual um, sites that we normally think of. And that person told me they were positive. Um, and, uh, and then I was able to get the information from that person. I didn't get it through another avenue. So we've had the self-reporting option, but yeah, um, yeah, we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing it um, kind of all over, yeah, from testing. So yeah, we see folks that are community acquired, some are household uh, contacts. Um, I'd say most folks we do know, but they're, uh, I'd say maybe 
70-30 on that if I had to do it with percentiles, but um, that's still a significant amount of folks. If I'm looking at 30% of our folks that maybe we're not able to really say for a fact where that source patient was. I know there's been an uptick where I work at Vernon Memorial, and I've seen them personally and taking care of them in the emergency department. So okay. there's been an increase since when the onset of this started happening in March till now. I'm seeing it more in the emergency room. Of course, I was off for four months, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just seeing, we're just seeing a bigger uptick right now. Right. And ours started toward the um, mid to end of July, has progressed through August, and then we're, we, have, we did have maybe a lull of a day or two, but yeah, we're seeing it pretty consistently every day. There's a case that we don't have a case now, it's an exception rather than the rule. Early on, we could go up to 30 days or more uh, without a positive case. That's just not happening anymore. Even with the masking mandate, we really haven't seen much of a decrease in, in the numbers at all. So I'm not sure if it's people that are choosing not to wear masks or if, if it's just the environment that they're in. Because even if both individuals are wearing a mask and they're in close contact, um, that's still considered a close contact. So masking is important, but it does not, unless it's an N95, it does not completely protect you from another individual, even if both folks are wearing it and they're together within six feet uh, for 15 minutes or more, or gosh, if they have exposure to respiratory droplets or they have direct physical contact. So yeah, yeah, that's, um, and, and our definitions and some of that information changes too. So we've had some morphing of recommendations. So uh, staying on top of that, it's important, but yes, it's changed how we identify uh, folks and then perform surveillance. Is there any other questions, concerns? I have Anyone one for Rose. I'm sorry, Carrie. Go ahead, um, uh, but yeah, with school back in, uh, what if this spikes? What would be the degree uh, before you would have those kids pulled out of school again with with them going back in person? But there are metrics that have been created. Um, DPI has some metrics. I've also uh, become, I, I also have access to some metrics as well that I've shared with the school districts. And schools can choose uh, varying thresholds for caution, warning, and the like. As far as looking at absenteeism of both staff and students, they can look at different thresholds. However, um, there are different degrees of closure. We can look, because most schools are cohorting students, especially in elementary and middle school grades, you'll find that there's a, there's a, a small group of children that typically attend from day to day. Um, and they're, uh, they're socially distanced in the classroom. And you'll find that, but if we had uh, a child there test positive, we might look at being able to limit a closure to perhaps a, a single classroom depending on activity within that particular geographic area of a school, perhaps we could limit it to maybe one grade, depending on the impact and the level of absenteeism between staff and students. Depending on how a campus is set up for a school district, we might have to look at closing a single building, or if it's an entire uh, district contained in one building and we find that there's significant exposure or maybe several positive cases within that district, we might have to shut the whole district down. Now, I only reference absenteeism as one reason for um, shutting down you know, uh, varying levels of a school. If cleaning needed to occur and things of that sort, that might also prompt a classroom grade or building for whatever reason to be shut down as well. So cleaning can have impact or we have to exclude folks from in-person instruction uh, because we just can't have folks there during terminal cleaning. On the other hand, the vast majority of the closures would be based upon absenteeism. And then the schools would decide what percentage uh, they would be looking at. But we, we're in direct consultation with schools. I pretty much talk to schools that are contained within Richland County every day and sometimes multiple times each day because scenarios occur um, and they never seem to fit that black and white definition that we're using. So that's kind of what we're looking at for schools. That's probably more than you need, but yeah. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on to our next agenda item, number eight, vouchers, review and approve vouchers. Is Robin on? Oh, there she is. There I am. Okay, we have a total this month of $34,071.02. The first couple of pages are our transportation um, mileage and reimbursements. So we'll hop over to page four. 
the very first one on the page um, for sixty dollars um, is from the or paid from the ADRC for a certified community resource specialist. Um, it's called AIRS certification. Um, moving to the bottom of the page, the rest of the page actually is our um, credit card bill for the month, totaling $3,301.72. Out of that, line four and five, um, that is our carryo bill. <coughs> And then um, notable is the one right below that for six seventeen oh two. Um, these were paid for from some of the ADRC COVID funds, and they are mark microwavable containers for the nutrition program. Seems to be actually being a regular expense every month, but we, we need to have those for the nutrition program. Moving to page five. Um, the only real notable one on this page is second from the bottom, number 49. This is our um, quarterly bill for Troy. We pay, pay that for our environmental health specialist um, four times a year. Moving to page six, the very first line for $4,015.98, this was the two laptops that were approved at last month's board. One for one of our CCS workers paid out of CCS and one for um, one of the contract chasers paid from COVID funding. Moving to page seven. Third down the page, we have a total of $799.06 to Quill. Most of this was for a copy paper order. Moving to page eight. To the shopping news, line number 31, midway down the page, $1,880. About half is being paid from our ADRC and half from behavioral health for 2020 local directory um, postings. And I have no more notable ones on page nine. Skip to page 10. And the very first one to Quick Trip, $457.99. This is for the nutrition program, pr pretty much purchasing milk for the, for the um, deliveries. And then the very last one on that page, we had four staff that are going to an annual crisis conference at UW Stevens Point. So they're signing up this paid for by our CCS program for $396. Oh, she switched on my sheet. <laughs> Second one down. That's all I had. Um, do you guys have any questions? Any questions? Hearing none, we will approve the vouchers and then I believe, don't we send you an email with our approvals? Also? Yep, I've got it ready right now to hit send as soon as I hear the verbal approval. All right, so I would entertain a motion to approve the vouchers. I did okay. Got a motion by Deborah Kaiser to approve our vouchers. Is there a second? I'll second it. Seconded by Peg Call. Is there any further discussion on our vouchers? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Remember to send your email approval to Robin so she can forward that on to the county clerk. And I'll give you guys a heads up that you guys are going to get a treat for the next couple months. I'm probably going to be on maternity leave for the next meeting, so Angie will be presenting these for a couple months. Congratulations in advance. Congratulations. Thanks. It's here, finally. <laughs> All right. Agenda item number nine, the 2020 budget summary and county placement reports. All right. 
So looking at the um, first table here, um, the utilization is um, to be about 67%. However, I just want to mention again, as I've mentioned in previous months, that in the second half of the year that, that um, 27th payroll, excuse me, hits our budget. So um, while most everything looks underutilized, um, once that last payroll hits, um, it will um, balance the utilization out. So I would expect for us to be somewhat low. Um, the one I'll quick go over, um, the routine ones I've been going over every month that I would say are probably a little bit lower than should be, um, starting with elderly services under ADRC at 52.1. We watched that and that's just because our transportation program was smaller towards the beginning of the year due to COVID. Moving down to mental health outpatient and AOTA, as well as APS, um, there were some unfilled positions and actually we had budgeted higher than our um, actual expenses were going to come in at. So I, I still think we're on track with these, but they do just show that we're um, at a lower utilization um, than what the original 2020 budget projected. And the last notable one was the very last one on that page, the children with disabilities. We just had less kids with the, that program um, due to COVID early in the year. So with that, moving to the middle table, which Tracy has up there. Um, we have almost $4 million in revenues. Our anticipated is quite a bit higher, I will say, the revenue that hasn't come in quite yet. We had a, um, the state holds back some of the revenue towards the end of the year, and that's gonna be released over this next month. So I would expect to um, have a lot more revenue coming over the next month, which is great. Um, right now our budget balance, you see that negative 450 number. Um, that assumes that the um, Winnebago Mental Health Institute charges are still within our core budget. And actually that is reality. Um, I know I've talked a lot about, about that chargeback. And um, this next month, I'm actually was hoping, it looks like a, a prob good probability that our Winnebago charges end up being more than, or less than our payments from cars. So we'd actually be able to resolve that char chargeback piece. However, um, I don't know if any of you have heard that our, our Derek um, Kalish over in the county clerk's office, who, who does all those, um, journal entry adjustments it has um, left the county position. And so I, I'm not sure we're gonna have anyone that knows how to post them in our system. So it's actually <laughs> now likely a reality that that just stays um, that way. But I think, you know, we've educated this group enough to understand that um, that, that negative number is not because of our core budget, it's because of the placements. We're just very likely this year not going to be able to make that chargeback happen unless they would get somebody hired and trained and um, up to speed real quick over there. Um, but that said, um, you can see that we still, taking that um, placement, the Winnebago charges, had we been able to remove them from the core budget, our core budget is still looking um, healthy this year at $49,199. So um, that's good news. Um, same thing as I just mentioned with the invoices. Um, I won't be here in a couple or the next meeting to um, present this. It'll be up to Tracy how she um, wants to handle it or I don't know if you have any comments on that, Tracy. You know, um, I, I think the, the difficult thing is that um, this is a, quite a process for Robin to um, do all of the, the tracking and get everything in so that we can establish where we're at in the budget um, each month. And I'm not sure that we have someone else who has that system knowledge and capability to, pre to prepare this budget report. Uh, during Robin's uh, family leave. So I, I'm not sure that we will have a budget report for you um, next month. 
Um, Robin has spent quite a bit of time kind of looking at how we're positioned and um, where we sit. Correct. And I, I think I'll, I'll speak for Robin, but feel free to jump in, Robin. But I think Robin's confidence level is uh, pretty high that the agency is on track. Yep. So if we don't have a budget report for you, um, probably in October and possibly I think November, we we have a high confidence level that the budget is on track. Uh, yep. There's we'll continue to do the placement report uh, because uh, that is um, put together by a group of staff who are so we'll still be able to do that. But we may not have two months of the budget report for you. Um, well, and in addition, if I was actually here with Derek being gone at the clerk's office, it sounds like they're just going to be too short staffed to do some of the actual posting. So some deposits may sit. And I'm not confident that our numbers would actually be accurate anyways with him gone. So um, while it's going to be a challenge with both him and I gone, I don't think a report necessarily next month would, would I, I don't know that for certain, but be um, useful anyways. But, so, Derek, okay. so Derek does all the chargebacks or? He does all the journal entries in the system. I think um, his comment to me was that um, with election stuff coming up, it's just a really busy time of the year for like Vic or someone else. I'm not for certain, certain on this, but to be able to pick up his slack, he said when he came in, I think things just um, had sat for a while just because they have other big roles to fill too. So. Yeah, I think they're going to be challenged over there until they get that position replaced. I, I saw out on the website, it's already posted, so. So it's not like we're not trying to claim that money back. It's just that it's just not being entered well, into the books. Correct. Even on my leave, I, I've got backups um, in place to make sure our claiming and everything happens to the money will still hit our bank. It's just recording it on our books is going to be the, um, the difficult part. And with regard to the chargeback that Robin refers to, um, yeah. that negative $450,000, so um, those expenses are in our core budget. That means that we haven't pulled any that amount of money out of the placement funds. So that money sits right. in the placement funds right now. Um, so when I show you the placement report, um, the picture that you'll see makes it look like uh, the placement fund is running into the hole, but that, that because that $450,000 is actually been taken from our core budget, that's, that's where we're seeing the, uh, that negative number. Is that, is that fair to say, Robin? Yep. Yes, yeah, so the placement report still looks accurate as if the chargebacks had happened. All right, are there any further questions on our budget summary? And then I think the last part was moving into I didn't present on the placement numbers. So, okay. Lou and Tracy okay. over there. Sorry for the interruption, but are people having technology issues? We've gotten a few reports and we lost Peg. Is everyone else able to listen and hear okay? Megan said she lost her screen completely, she can't see anyone. Mine is doing okay. Some people are cutting in and out occasionally. She's trying to get okay. She's trying to get Peg back on. All right. Well, we'll keep we'll keep going. Did we say if Jerry's not here today? I don't know. I didn't. He's not on. And he didn't let me know if he's going to be here or not, so I don't know. Yeah, I did. I did not heard from him. Nor have I. And I see Peg's back on. And I think Megan just shut down to try to bring it back up, see if that would work for her, since we're all, the rest of us are in good shape. I would uh, just note with recognizing some of those problems, we are recording our meeting. Um, we haven't done this up till now, but I think we're going to start trying to post it, the meeting on the website, the recording, so individuals would be able to then view the meeting um, who weren't able to attend.
What do we have for a placement report? All right, I'm gonna share the screen again. Okay, so you should be seeing the placement summary here uh, for adult placements, which is Fund 54, uh, the adult institutional and inpatient placements. Uh, you'll see that in July, um, we had a few more days of placement than in June, but it's still a lower number than what we had seen earlier in the year. Uh, and we have had increased use of crisis stabilization services. Uh, just a reminder that crisis stabilization is uh, not a hospital level of care, but oftentimes it may be used to, uh, to have a safe place for someone to go, um, but not have to have them go to an inpatient unit or to the institution or a person uh, may transition from a hospital or institutional placement as a step down as they're um, moving back into the community. So we are seeing more utilization of that. So uh, we have about 40,000, uh, 522,000, pardon me, 40,522 of um, expenses for crisis stabilization. Uh, that is a program that is partially reimbursed by Medicaid and insurance, so we have been getting some reimbursements for that. Adult institutional costs are at 599,354. And I'm gonna scroll down to the adult community residential placements. Um, as you can see, we have more residential placement days in July, we have moved um, that high cost placement out of uh, the institution and into a community placement. So you're seeing more expense showing up here. Uh, the month of July was uh, 82,000 and then with reimbursements, it came down to 53,000. So we are getting significant reimbursements, but because that's such a high cost placement, we will see more expenses um, in our community uh, residential placements than we have previously. Um, this is a CCS placement. And so when we do the reconciliation process next year, where we claim all of these 2020 expenses, our hope is that we'll recoup more reimbursement because of those expenses. So the um, adult residential uh, costs uh, total 122, excuse me, 121,313. So the total in Fund 54, which is the adult placements, is 761,190. So you know that we started the year with 482,000 in the placement fund uh, 54. So that means that fund, um, if all of the expenses were applied there, would be uh, a negative 278,912. This is where that um, negative 450,000 that Robin was referencing, the charge, if the chargeback were to occur, this uh, fund 54 would be in the negative 278,000. Um, and of course, uh, we don't want it to be in the negative either in our core budget or in the placements. So scrolling down to the uh, child placements, which is fund 44. Uh, our uh, institutional placements for children has not changed substantially. Uh, we have seen an increase in uh, the use of detention. Uh, we have a youth who we have placed uh, uh, outside of the county and uh, has been needing more of the detention services because of behavioral concerns and safety concerns. Um, so we are going to see uh, continued placement in the uh, detention line. So our uh, total for child institutional placements is 147,312 and detention cost is 22,325. 
and then scrolling down to our foster care. Uh, we have had a few increased placements for treatment foster care or group home placements. Uh, and uh, the regular foster care has remained uh, the same for the last few months. So the uh, group home and treatment foster care expense is uh, 96,443. The regular uh, foster care cost is 16,462. So for all of fund 44, we have an expense of 282,542. That fund started the year with 527,000 in it. And so there is 244,799 remaining in that fund. So the adult fund is uh, in the deficit and there are still funds in the Child Fund 44. So I'm gonna switch to another uh, screen to show you. Uh, I've been showing you this uh, for the last several months. Uh, so this again reflects uh, the monthly costs that the county incurs with placements and compares to the last couple of years. So in gray, you have the monthly cost for 2018, light blue is the monthly cost for 2019, and dark blue is our current year. So in uh, 2020, uh, fund 44 and 54 combined started the year with 1,009,619. Um, the recommended carryover of 2019 remaining uh, from the Health and Human Services budget. Uh, Robin and I had a call with the auditor, I think it was yesterday, uh, who has confirmed the amount that was remaining uh, in 2019. Uh, so previously, we've shown you our very conservative estimate of 340,000, and the auditor, we were very happy uh, to have her report that there is 551,954 remaining in the Health and Human Services budget at the end of 2019. That money has been transferred to the general fund, which is the usual practice. Uh, because we just learned about this yesterday, we didn't get anything on our agenda for today, but what Health and Human Services would be doing is uh, requesting a, a motion uh, that passes over to the Finance Committee uh, to transfer that money into the placement funds uh, to, to help with those expenses that we have this year. So that has not happened yet. That is something that the county has done over the last several years when funds remain in the Health and Human Services core budget in order to help fund the placement um, expenses. So if that were to happen, there would be 1,561,000 available to cover the placement expenses for 2020. Our current expenses, so uh, kind of looking down here at this red number, uh, if they uh, continued at the same rate they have for the last seven months, we would end the year at 1,789,000 in placement expenses. Now we are hoping that some of the things that we're doing uh, will cause that trend to go down, but right now this is what it's looking like. Uh, if that were the case, uh, we would still have a shortfall of $258,000 with the placement fund. Does anybody have any questions with that? These are not voluntary placements, correct? Generally, no, although there are some placements where uh, some of the community placements that where we utilize CCS services uh, that uh, the individual has that high level of need. They are not under a court order, but it's a need-based placement. Uh, if the individual were not placed, they potentially would be at risk of institutionalization. So I can't say hard and fast that every placement is 
um, involuntary or court ordered, the majority of them are, but um, we utilize placements uh, in various ways to meet people's needs. So I know in the hospital, if somebody is voluntarily wants to be institutionalized for, for mental health care, that it's their bill to pay. But when it becomes involuntary in court ordered or chaptered or whatever it is, that then the, it's the responsibility of the government entity to care for them. Well, actually, um even when somebody is placed involuntarily, they still um, have the responsibility to pay for their, their placement and their services. Uh, and that's why uh, some of our, when we do uh, an emergency detention uh, for someone and they end up, whether it's at Winnebago or even one of the, like Gunderson or, um, one of the other inpatient hospitals, if they have insurance, their insurance covers that even though it's involuntary. So the placements that the county pays for is when the client does not have an ability to play, to, excuse me, to pay or another funding source that can be utilized. Any other questions? We'll move on to contract. Monitoring report. I think Tracy's going to get that up there for you. Okay, so uh, we're looking at monitoring um, all of these contracts. Most have submitted bills through the end of July. Uh, there's a few with August and some still with June, but I will um, highlight anything on the far right side that has a percentage utilized over 58%. Uh, so on the first page, um, it looks about halfway down. This is the one that keeps coming up, Family and Children's Center. Uh, it's at 71% utilization. And that is trending um, by the end of the year should be okay um, for what they planned on using that for. So it will trend um, in a couple months a little bit better. Uh, that's all I see on page one. Page two, uh, everything is, is trending on target there or underutilized, page three. Same there, everything's trending pretty well. Uh, page four, we've got um, just a few up from the bottom is Cario. Uh, that's at 63% utilization, but you'll see they've billed us through August. So that is actually just fine. Uh, page five, um, this is where three up from the bottom Tellarian is at 118% almost utilization, and we will be amending that later on the agenda um, and give an explanation for what happened there too. So uh, page six, and that's where Winnebago is as well that I've been tracking as well, uh, which Tracy mentioned earlier. Any questions for me? All right. Hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number 11, approved contracts, agreements, and amendments. So there was an, a revised handout um, that was uploaded, and that should have Tellarian added on there as well. Yep, there it is. It looks like Miranda will talk about these. Yeah, um, so um, the top one is for our children's long-term support unit. Um, it's um, to assist with adaptive um, vehicle aids for a child with disabilities. And then um, the second one, I believe, is Jessica's unit. So the second one, we asked last um, month for a revision in a contract for community care resources. We thought that both these programs ran under community care resources and one is actually billed under community care programs and one is under community care resources. So the resources is related to treatment foster care and programs is related to um, psychosexual evaluations and treatment for a youth. 
um, who is under a, a youth justice case. So um, we needed to um, modify because we had asked for a, a additional funding under resources and we thought it was covered under both. However, needed to add this one as we found that the um, assessments that we had been doing were not covered under the community care resources um, contract. So this is just an additional uh, contract that we had thought was already covered and had been utilizing, but um, actually it, they're two separate entities, although they're run through the same uh, facility. And I think the these have to be approved separately from the amendment. So I would entertain a motion to approve one motion for adaptive driving LLC amount of twenty five thousand. Motion. motion by Debbie Kaiser. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Seconded by Peg Call. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I know this has been discussed before, so I apologize. <laughs> but um, could you just, and maybe this will help some of the newer members too, because I'm still not remembering. Is this funding, um, is this things that are covered I can't remember. I know sometimes you guys specifically say they're, they're CCS, but could you just explain the process of what these contracts mean? Do you want me to start with the adaptive driving? Um, I just mean in general, the fact that we're amending contracts. What does that mean? So these are actually, these two contracts are new contracts. So these are not contract amendments. So there is a need um, specific that we've identified and so in order to get the service we're going to be contracting with them. Uh, the funding sources, I don't know if we, do we have the funding sources on here? Um, I don't see the funding sources. I don't no. see that. Usually I only specify if it's CCS because otherwise it gets kind of additional, you know, there could be three or four funding sources um, that they're taking yeah. from. And when you say funding sources, what do you mean? This does not come out of our budget. I'm sorry if these are silly questions. If, if I understand you right, Ingrid, so when I say funding source, it's kind of how are we covering the costs of that contract? Um, so it may be when we say CCS, then we know that we're going to bill Medicaid for it through the CCS program. Um, for some cases, we the funding comes from uh, state allocations, whether it's CLTS program or some of the other programs, uh, and other times it's tax levy that we're drawing upon to cover the cost of the service. Is that is that what you were asking about? So, what, at what point do we? I guess is there a way to monitor like when we're because we do this frequently throughout the year. So is there like a certain? I mean, and I'm not talking about making new contracts necessarily, but like amending contracts. Is there a certain point, like if it is affecting tax levy, where somehow we pass this? I just, I guess I'm confused by the process a little bit. So generally, like when we do these contracts, we're identifying that we have um, money budgeted somehow that we allocate um, and that, that we're drawing upon for these contracts. Uh -huh. So we certainly can talk about whether or not, you know, having a contract is going to cause an issue. I think when we talked about that Vista Care contract, which is the CCS contract for that very expensive placement, we spent some time talking about mm -hmm. how um, CCS was not going to cover that whole cost and that we were, we were going to draw upon the institutional funds to cover the remainder of that placement. So um, maybe we can really focus a little bit better on, you know, that this is something that we have a budget line for and it's still covered under the budget that we aren't exceeding our budget or expecting to exceed our budget because we're establishing a new contract. Um, generally, when we do this, it means that there's a service that we can't get through one of our existing contracts. Um, so we need to find a provider who can provide that, but it doesn't mean that we didn't um, have a, budget line where we would be drawing from the cover. 
I, I hope I'm getting at what you're asking. Yes, you are. And thank you for clarifying that. It's, it's hard to keep track of all the different things. So thank you. Yep. Miranda, can you describe to me what vehicle adaptive aids are? <laughs> So oftentimes, um, it, just for an example, um, it might be a wheelchair lift or something, um, and that particular um, adaptive driving contract um, is covered either um, through our children's long-term support waiver or, um, or through our CCAP funds, but um, likely the children's long-term support waiver, which is state funding. Um, but, but a wheelchair lift can be an option. It might be um, a child with disabilities of driving age who might... Um, need ad adaptations to a steering wheel or um, different things of that sort. Any other further questions? For adaptive driving, LLC, the motion that was made to approve the $25,000 budget. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We entertain a motion for community care programs in contract amount up to ten thousand um, dollars. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I am a little confused. I thought those were both included. Do we have to do them separately? I, I may have misspoke. Um, I know that there's an amendment coming after this. Um, I didn't mean to say that these two couldn't be um, uh, approved together. Uh, so I. I know you've already voted on the first one, but generally, if we're just doing new contracts, they can be um, approved as a block. I, I think I may have steered that um, in a different direction. I, I think now that you've made the motion and approved the adaptive driving, um, we probably have to approve this one separately, but I, I, that was my fault. I can make that motion. Motion by Ingrid. Is there a second? I second it. Second by Debbie. It. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to an amended contract. Um, so Tolarian um, is our um, agency that we use for crisis stabilization services. Um, and those are often individuals who um, have needed a hospital level of care, or um, we would place individuals there that um, maybe um, we would divert from going to a hospital level of care. So um, that was a bit more utilized than we anticipated with some individuals needing hospitalization in August. So um, that's the reason for the request. And um, this is funded um, par partially through Medicaid um, crisis stabilization services or um, private insurances, and then partially um, through that placement fund. I would just so, add, um, Carrie, you were asking about voluntary um, placements versus involuntary placements. We might use um, this uh, Tolarian for crisis stabilization. It would not be an involuntary placement, but it may prevent the need for um, using something like uh, Winnebago. So it's still um, in the placement fund, but, but um, it's, it's at a lower cost than what the county might incur otherwise, and better for the individual. So the amount that our original contract is is thirty thousand. We are amending it to seventy-five thousand. That's one hundred and five thousand. But we want to go an extra twenty thousand. So I, I think it may have even been last month that we uh, amended that thirty thousand dollar contract to seventy-five thousand. We thought that it would okay. probably top out at seventy-five thousand. And I think uh, whether it was a miscalculation or I think Miranda mentioned that we had some increased placements there that we recognize it really is going to probably end the year closer to 125,000. Okay. We entertain a motion to amend the contract to 125,000. 
I move the motion, Debbie Kaiser. Motion by Debbie Kaiser. Is there a second? Second. Yep. Seconded by Ms. Glassbrenner. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Personnel updates. All right. Um, we have a kind of an updated version of our usual personnel updates. I just want to remind uh, the board members that uh, I guess we started in uh, June with uh, proposing some amendments to the Health and Human Services Handbook that transferred some of the personnel approval uh, responsibilities over to the county administrator rather than um, to the board doing that, but we still want to give you the regular updates, although I don't believe this will require um, board action to approve any longer. So I'll show you, uh, I think I've got the screen up now. So the memo is just a little bit different. We have no new hires uh, since our last meeting. Um, we do have one staff who has completed the probationary period. That's Edie Moore, who is a CCS supervisor. Uh, she completed effective September 2nd. Um, no disciplinary suspension or um, dismissals and no termination. So these are now approved uh, by the county administrator rather than this board. So this is for the board's information. If it's all right, I'll just move on down the page if you'd like. Go um, ahead. So uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little, get myself lost here. Uh, so as far as Southwest Workforce Development Board, our leased staff, uh, we, uh, for the top three, for Katie Pechkowski and Amber Morris and Nicole Gaudet, uh, we were attempting to have staff be able to do some of the contact tracing uh, for public health. And we initially thought that uh, because they are county employees and working in separate areas that they could do this work after hours as leased staff, but what we learned was uh, we really can't do that. Uh, those staff are still doing this work for public health after hours, but uh, in, they will be paid um, for their time as county employees. We're drawing upon some COVID funding uh, that has been allocated to the public health department to cover those extra expenses but under uh, Southwest Workforce Development Board, um, on the record, there was a hire and essentially a revocation of those hires. And then the last name is uh, Francine or Fran Ewing, uh, has been hired as an LTE secretary to work uh, in our admin services and assist with our main front desk. And uh, she officially starts on the 14th of September. And then uh, finally, I wanted to uh, make the board aware that uh, we did have a leave of absence without pay for up to 30 days that was authorized. Um, Tony Cabrera, the economic support specialist, uh, had a leave due to a medical need um, and was not eligible for FMLA. So effective um, August 18th, uh, she was approved for that. And that was that 30 day approval is something that uh, my position as the director is allowed to approve. If it needed to be longer, it would go through, I think the personnel committee. And then you also can see the vacant positions uh, that are on the books. So the behavioral health services, mental health therapist, we, um, have been attempting to hire those positions for quite some time. Uh, we did, uh, we do have some interviews coming up, which we're um, keeping our fingers crossed that we might be able to fill them. Uh, the administrative clerical assistant, 
uh, and everything below that are positions that are on hold because uh, we did not have them funded in our budget. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number 13, quarterly review of Health and Human Services organizational chart. Okay, and I'm gonna let Angie talk you through this. There it is. All right, so since last month, um, I just wanted to point out a few changes that we've had. Some are kind of bigger because of the unit changes, the split. Um, so we could go to the next page, Tracy, if you can. There we go. Um, so this has administration and building operations, um, which is the first far left block in blue. And it's broken out um, with myself as the manager and then all the staff below. Um, the only new person there would be what Tracy had just mentioned, Fran or Francine Ewing is the second um, column, second block down as a LTE secretary through the leasing agency. Otherwise, those are all the staff that are um, in administration and building operations. Now with that split, if you go to the next page, three, uh, this would be the Aging and Disability Resource Center. No changes there since last report. Page four is behavioral health services and no changes there since the last report and page five is then the new other unit business and financial services with robin as the manager of that unit and the staff um, the fiscal specialists that are with her as well and then if you go to the next page six uh, child and Youth Services, no changes there since our last uh, report. Page seven has uh, Economic Support Unit, no changes there, updates. And then the last page, page eight, is our Public Health, um, which there are some changes um, on the far left. I know I've reviewed um, some of those at the bottom, Cheryl Scott and Jade Johnson that were hired on um, to help with the COVID response. And then just to the right of Cheryl Scott is Teresa Landis, and she is actually a, a public health nurse, um, LTE through the leasing agency, works part-time with contact tracing. Um, and otherwise, I think everything else is the same on that page as well. Any questions or anything you want me to clarify? Do we pay the leasing agency to provide staff for us or? Yeah, they charge us a 7% administration fee to do their payroll and all their benefits rolled through um, their system. Move on to agenda item number 14, approve new nutrition advisory council member. Now, does this have to be to replace Peg Call, county board supervisor, or is this a citizen member that's open? No, oh, is Roxanne here? I'm not sure if I know the answer to this. It's it's actually Rose, and I, yep, oh, she, I'm you, you were on, she, that's okay, she was, she was on mute, and then I saw her, she was talking. Yes, this is actually a citizen member. Um, we had an individual who resigned her position or her, 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 before her tenure ended, and then this person will replace that other individual. And you'll see in the mail out, it gives you details regarding the individual who is no longer uh, available to provide representation on that Nutrition Advisory Council. Uh, her name is Eva Jo Putz. She left uh, prior to the end of her term, and then another individual applied for that particular position position and was approved by the Nutrition Advisory Council and uh, her name is Jane Mussey. Or I think it's, uh, I think that's as close as I can get to the pronunciation. And then uh, again, her, um, her uh, application was approved and it's now being brought to your uh, attention so that you can approve it and then it'll actually have to be forwarded on to the Committee on Committees and the County Board for approval. I would entertain a motion for 
appointing Miss Moosey to the Nutrition Advisory Council and to send it on to finance and personnel for approval. County Board. This is Peg and I approve Jane Moosey to the uh, Nutrition Board. Motion by Jane, or excuse me, motion by Peg Call to, for approval. Is there a second? I second it, Debbie Kaiser. Seconded by Debbie Kaiser. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Agenda item number 15, approved 2020-2021 influenza immunization fees. Every year prior to the influenza vaccine administration season, uh, we have uh, we review the cost that we pay when we uh, these are purchase vaccines, and uh, we look at the cost of both high dose and quadrivalent that we provide the folks that are under the age of 65, and uh, uh, you can tell. Uh, what we're looking at here for our, our uh, out-of-pocket costs per dose, it's forty-eight twenty-nine for high dose, and it is fifteen dollars and ninety-one cents for the quadrivalent. Um, when we charge folks um, uh, that don't have insurance coverage or choose to pay, um, you know, uh, from their own personal finances, we charge sixty-five dollars for the high dose and then forty dollars for the quadrivalent product. We were asking that those particular um, uh, fees be um, approved again this year. Year, they reflect no change from the 2019-2020 influenza season. You heard the background on the influenza immunization fees. What is your pleasure? Motion by Peg Call, seconded by... So I'll second that myself. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We have a quorum still. I don't see Dan's we picture. Four. Up here. We have four, four still? Sure. There. All right, we'll move on to agenda item number 16, approved treatment alternatives and diversion for the TAD grant, five-year grant. So this is a reapplication for our treatment court or treatment alternative and diversions grant. Um, and this is applying for the funds for year five. Um, and then um, hopefully next year we will apply for a new um, five-year cycle as well, but that will um, come down the road later. Um, treatment court, um, as you may see, um, has meetings posted that are open to the community. Since the implementation of the grant in 2016, it served a total of 26 participants. Um, during 2019, we received $144,823, um, and then the match dollar amount was, th um, oops, I see a little error there. Um, $34,320. And the requested grant amount for 2021 is going to be $163,334 and an anticipated match of approximately $40,834. So just a request to reapply for um, the fifth year of that five-year grant cycle. In the background, what is your pleasure? Make a motion to approve. Motion by Mrs. Glassbrenner. Is there a second? Debbie Kaiser. Okay. Seconded by Debbie Kaiser. Any discussion? Was this something that the judge started a while back in 2016? It is. It was started um, with the courts, with the um, district attorney's office, and health and human services, um, as well as, as probation and other community treatment providers. And we still have the same person overseeing that program? Yeah, Tiffany? Tiffany, Tiffany Olson is our treatment court coordinator, yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Move on to agenda item number 17, approved purchase of a laptop computer. Let's see, is Jeff Jessica Jessica here? Yep. Yes. Um, we're looking to purchase a laptop for our youth aid worker, Eric Ives. Um, he's using uh, quite an old laptop that was repurposed, and we uh, were able to free up some of our Promoting Safe and Stable Families funding that has not been utilized for the YES program, which is our community service-based pro program this year. Um, we're not doing in-person services, so there was an excess in that that we're able to utilize to upgrade that and provide Eric with a laptop and docking station to be able to work more efficiently in a remote setting. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the laptop. Motion by pay call, seconded by? Debbie Kaiser. Debbie Kaiser. Not a roll today, Debbie. Is there <laughs> any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Gen item number 18, review and approve updates to the 2021 Health and Human Services budget. All right. Um, so as you know, we presented a budget last month uh, that the board approved. Um, we're a little out of sync. Uh, because uh, we went to the uh, Finance and Personnel Committee ahead of this board. It's just kind of the order that things have happened uh, immediately following uh, our board meeting. And it was anticipated that Health and Human Services would be asked to submit an amended budget with some reductions. Uh, so I have a presentation to kind of explain where we're at with that. Um, and some additional information to share. So I'm going to share my screen again. All right. So now you will be looking at the uh, 2021 amended preliminary budget, and that's because it has not been um, uh, fully approved by the county board yet. Uh, so uh, let's see here. As I mentioned, um, the budget was presented to the Finance and Personnel Committee uh, in, on September 1st, but immediately following our uh, board meeting, uh, the county administrator, after putting all of the budgets together, uh, recognized that uh, the full county budget came up with a $764,000 gap in tax levy um, for the overall county budget. So shortly following our August meeting, uh, the county administrator directed Health and Human Services to amend that preliminary budget that you approved um, for the Finance and uh, Personnel Committee. So, uh, our task was to um, take out $120,000 of the tax levy from our budget. And uh, at that time, we also learned that uh, we should estimate a 7% increase in health insurance costs. Uh, continuing with the no uh, pay plan in excuse me, no pay plan increases for the staff salaries at that time. So the budget that is approved by Health and Human Services Board has already been presented to the county administrator and has already been presented to the Finance and Personnel Committee on September 1st. So what I'm showing you, uh, again, we're going a little out of order because normally the uh, budget would be approved by this board and then moved on to the um, committee approval process. Uh, there's also a Finance and Personnel Committee um, meeting in uh, next Wednesday. Uh, the budget was presented on September 1st, uh, and the committee at that time tabled the budget 
agenda item uh, because uh, they asked to have the, the departments look at some additional um, issues. So I'll, I'll come back to that, but I wanna show you what has changed um, with the budget that um, you had previously seen. So in making that $120,000 cut to our tax levy, um, we still wanted to keep the priorities as much as possible uh, to maintain our existing services to the community and try to uh, resist reductions in services. So we have those um, original goals that we had to increase mental health services to the community uh, to try to address the staffing needs for adult protective services, crisis services, public health, and our administration. Um, we still uh, wanted to sufficiently fund the placements um, while continuing efforts to reduce expenses that get applied to the placement funds. Uh, we continue to want to improve staff retention and recruitment, including increasing staff morale support and professional growth opportunities, um, working to maximize our revenue sources and other funding opportunities, uh, the need to address the physical building needs, um, including safety, security, building maintenance, and space needs, and uh, improve the agency's reputation as a trusted community resource and partner. So in, in the amended budget, we continued um, to keep that new crisis APS position in order to help increase with the increased workload of crisis and adult protective services. Um, that funding uh, is drawn from increased state uh, reimbursement provided to counties um, who regionalize for crisis services. Um, the other piece that we kept in the amended budget is the increase of four hours of psychiatric services, uh, which is funded by CCS revenue. We also kept in this amended budget a plan to fill one of the vacant public health nurse positions in order to address the staffing shortage in public health. And certainly this is a time where staffing is a big issue with all of the work that that department is doing. So the funding allocated uh, existing tax levy from other areas of health and human services and diverted it toward public health. Um, but uh, we, in order, because tax levy is the area that we needed to cut, um, we used a strategy, which I'll show you at the end, to um, assure that we could keep this position in the budget. The other part was to address the admin support needs. Um, the plan to continue that least clerical position that we just talked about today is still in the budget for 2021. Um, we're drawing on funding from CCS in order to cover the expense for that. We maintain the plan for our 2021 budget to uh, transfer uh, those leased positions, six long-term existing full-time positions um, from the Southwest Workforce Development Board to uh, becoming county positions. So that's three CCS service facilitators, one substance abuse counselor, one school therapist and crisis counselor, and one custodian. Um, there's actually a savings to the budget uh, in terms of the um, true costs of what it, it is to lease a staff. Um, Angie mentioned that we pay a 7% administration fee to Southwest Workforce Development Board in order to um, manage the benefits for those staff. Um, that is, in the end, it comes out to be cost neutral, um, partially because of the different funding streams we utilize um, really are based on what our expenses are. And, and not if our expenses don't go down, our ability to claim 
uh, money to cover those expenses also goes down. So in your um, iPad folders, you have a document that looks like this, and I'm just gonna um, show you in the slides to kind of break it down. So with this amended preliminary budget, you'll see that um, the assumptions include uh, reduction in tax levy by $120,000. Oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I just want to ask a clarifying question on that term. Um, there's probably a really obvious answer to this, but this isn't my forte. So um, in like the document um, that was presented, because I happened to attend the, the finance and personnel meeting on the first, the one where um, a county administrator presented what each budget or what each department needed to cut. In there, it uses the term um, for Health and Human Services to reduce operating levies by 120,000. And then in this document, it says that the reduction is tax levy of 120,000. So maybe they're the same thing, but when I hear operating level, levy, I think operating expenses. Which means yep. Yes, thank, thank you for that, Ingrid. I, I, that's not a, a term that I, generally use, but yes, they we're really talking about the same thing. Tax levy or operating levy um, is really referring to the county's funding that comes to the departments. Okay, okay, thank you. You bet. So the, uh, the amended um, preliminary budget includes also the 7% increase in health insurance. I know there's some work being done to see whether or not that can be a little bit less of an increase. Um, like I said, the plan to transition six existing full-time Southwest Workforce Development Board staff to county positions to create the crisis APS new position um, and to fill one of the vacant public health nurse positions. So the new budget uh, comes down to what you see on the far right hand corner of your screen. So you'll see uh, a little bit grayed out the 2021 original proposed budget for comparison and then the um, 2021 amended proposed budget and then you also have 2019 and the 2020 uh, budgets uh, to compare for the past. Um, so the, the, you'll see some changes in expenses. Um, some of the, the increased expenses are primarily due to uh, that health insurance increase, uh, but we moved quite a bit around to try to achieve this uh, savings in tax levy. So if we could uh, think that we could allocate something more to a CCS expense, it may have been pulled out of administrative services and put into behavioral health because that's where the CCS um, expenses lie. So there won't be a actual just across, you know, what you see in the administrative services line may not reflect just health insurance changes in costs. In the end, um, the number, the 822,000 here is the, um, the amount of tax levy that we reduced to. And this is how we got to that. So um, what we did was uh, we reduced that maintenance custodian position from 40 hours to 35 hours a week, uh, creating a savings of $5,000. That position currently is uh, 35 hours a week, but in the 2021 budget, we had planned on increasing it to 40. 40 hours a week. Um, so we backed it back down to what it currently is in order to save $5,000 in tax levy. Um, we reduced our building operations and supply budget by $5,000. We reassigned a portion of the electronic health record expense from tax levy to CCS. Uh, we took a closer look at how um, that 
electronic health record is used and we felt that this was a legitimate shifting of that expense off of the tax levy. We shifted AMZO from the ADRC budget to offset tax levy uh, reduction in the admin budget. So AMZO is, Robin, do you, are you able to tell me the, what AMZO stands for? Um, I think it's administrative management. Management, um, something overhead. <laughs> Those are our overhead costs. So the cost right, of the okay. building, the cost of my position, Robin's position. So. Those are things that we claim in various programs. And so the ADRC, we claim AMZO. Agency um, management and support overhead. There, got it. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than have those, uh, that, those funds that we claim in the ADRC, we shifted them over to the administration um, to cover the, the, the cost of our support system by $5,000. Um, we added the enhanced IM economic support funding in the 2021 budget. Um, this is an annual payment that we've consistently received, uh, but because it's been so variable, we haven't usually budgeted for it. Um, we felt that the 25,000 was a reasonable conservative estimate. Um, frequently, uh, the, what we receive in that annual payment is higher than that. Um, and that's being used to offset tax levy. We reduced uh, tax levy funding for court ordered um, chapter 51 evaluations to align more with what our uh, expense history has been. I think we had 25,000 in there and we felt that um, when we looked at what our history had been that we really weren't spending that much. Next slide, Tom. Yes. Right. Could you go back to the, the economic, I didn't quite understand what you said with the economic support funding. You're predicting there will be that funding, is that, could you clarify? Yeah. Um, so that uh, 25,000, we've been getting an annual payment of enhanced funding uh, from the state uh, through the capital consortium that we belong to. Um, and every year we get an enhanced funding payment, but because it has been variable, I, uh, Robin, are you able to, or maybe Stephanie, to tell what our, did, did we know our payment for this year? Yep, our payment this year was 53 something, and then I think it was the prior year 50, and then it was 40, and then it kind of had backed off. So um, I think we're, we're becoming a little more confident that this is regular, but it sounds like um, at the beginning of the fiscal year, Stephanie said they would know whether or not this is really un, a totally unbudgeted item. It's just depending on if they have the funding or not. So, um, this is to the enhanced, it's enhanced Medicaid funding. It comes from um, the feds, it, it uh, trickles down to the states every year. It was through the Affordable Care Act. Um, so, it's just additional funding that we receive for, for basically um, providing any services uh, around um, Medicaid eligibility, Badger Care, those programs? Sure. Well, it's hard to count on because they typically don't sell it till the very last minute at the end of the year. So we haven't budgeted for that purpose because there's no guarantee of getting it. And then the fact that they have typically sent it pretty late. So just to clarify again, you are based on previous years, assuming we'll have this funding and then we don't utilize it within that so it can be applied to budget or I'm just, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're actually for 2021 counting on getting it to go towards to fund our budget. And we're even so though it's economic support, it can be used for anything agency wide. It, it doesn't have to be used for my programs. It can fill holes. Okay. And so typically you get a larger amount than this, so you still have some that you use for economic support. Is that correct? If, if there's a need, uh, that's the, because it usually comes so late in the year, we, we try to take a look at what we might um, be able to utilize it for. Okay. Uh, the other part of, that, of economic support is uh, that program tends to be pretty fully funded unless there's um, a specific need that really isn't anticipated in the budget. So we could use it for that, but we, we haven't 
we like we purchased um, some new computers a couple of years ago, but we were able to fund that within our allocation, so we didn't need to draw upon uh, upon monies like this. Okay. So yes, yeah, so I think like Robin said, so one year forty thousand, one year fifty thousand, this year roughly fifty five thousand. So we feel pretty comfortable um, budgeting twenty five thousand, uh, thinking that we're pretty. Um, safe expecting that much and potentially more. Okay, and so Stephanie, you said that the funding stipulations do allow for that to be put agency-wide, not just economic support? Correct, yep. Thank you. All right, so um, one service reduction that we did um, decide to make uh, is we eliminated the tax levy funded residential treatment for substance use disorders. Um, historically, for many years, there's been anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dollars put in the budget to uh, be able to send individuals to treatment um, when they needed a residential treatment as opposed to outpatient treatment. And um, some counties uh, still provide funding for residential treatment and many counties do not. And so the decision that I made was that we would go the way of the counties that do not provide that tax levy funding for that. There are some other options for us to try to help individuals get residential treatment. The um, Treatment court has uh, some funding set aside for residential treatment, so individuals who might be going through treatment court would still have that as an option. There are some residential treatment resources um, uh, that are uh, faith-based that are not at a cost, so if that matched up with the individual's needs, we would help them access that. Um, and we're looking at how our CCS program might be utilized to um, have Medicaid pay for residential treatment. So uh, this is a service reduction, uh, but we are looking for ways that we can still help people get that treatment if that's what they need. Um, residential treatment costs anywhere from five to seven thousand dollars for a treatment episode and so twenty thousand dollars would cover uh, three to four individuals be depending on the cost of what that treatment episode would be so we're um, eliminating the option for three to four individuals to get that treatment Ms. Gerson, is there any concern that that would cost what does outpatient treatment cost us like in other words, are we saving on the front end, but potentially um, losing on the back end? Well, it's, it's kind of based on, you know, what is the level of care that's needed based on the person's um, level of addiction. So outpatient is part of our outpatient clinic and, and there's, a, there's a tool that's used to assess what the person's level of care should be for treatment. So if it identifies that the person needs outpatient services, that, that is the level of care that they're referred to. Uh, the new level of care that we are developing at Health and Human Services is that intensive outpatient, which is a higher level of care uh, that Miranda is, has talked about. Um, so if, uh, that would be an option uh, to avoid the need of residential treatment. But if someone has very severe addiction and needed that level of care, um, the county wouldn't have tax levy to help fund them. We would have to look for other resources and potentially we wouldn't have that care to offer. We would have to um, use a lower level of care to help try to meet those needs. How many people do we have many that would utilize that? I know, like, how many do we have in a year? Are you able to speak to that, Miranda? Yeah, I apologize. I just didn't hear what was the last part of your question. How many people? Well, it says we're eliminating funding for three to four individuals. 
how many individuals actually utilize this residential placement or treatment funding? So um, during this year, we've had two people go to residential treatment, uh, but one um, used one of those um, faith-based funded resources, so that was at no cost to the county. And then um, the more recent individual um, actually went to, um, it's a grant funded program through that agency or that residential treatment center in the Green Bay area. So. Um, so far, we've had two people utilize that resource, um, like Tracy talked about. There are other resources, um, intensive outpatient programming through our agency and others. Um, we've had a few people use day treatment services, um, level of care um, that's available in um, Madison. So, um, but right now this year, we've had two people that um, have met that level of care and have actually um, Followed through or gone forward with getting the treatment. Wasn't there an actual new facility that was being developed in our area for um, residential treatment of this through Southwest Tap? No. I think oh. what you might be referring to is the sober living house that's being yeah. developed, and that, that, is, that is not residential treatment. So uh, that's after. Um, well, a, a person may may be able to stay at the sober living house um, while they're getting treatment. They may be involved in like intensive outpatient or outpatient treatment, but it's a, a safe recovery oriented place for them to live. And it's self supported in that the person is expected to work and pay rent toward their stay. It's not a treatment based, although it is recovery oriented. Um, space is, is that fair to say, Miranda? If you have anything to add, please do. No, that's correct. That's right. Okay, thank you. All right, and then the last two uh, that uh, helped us get to the hundred and twenty thousand is uh, there is some one-time carryover of the 2020 balance in fund 34 which is our public health fund that we will carry over to 2020 um, in order to re reduce the tax levy that we have in uh, public health for that um, filling that position that i mentioned uh, we are accessing um, cares funding for covid uh, this year, and we anticipate to have that 20,000 to be able to carry over into next year. Uh, the issue or the risk with that is um, that we won't have that to carry over into future years, uh, so we will have to still solve our budget um, issue when we are building the 2022 budget. The same is true in the last item, a one-time carryover of under unutilized 2020 state nutrition funding uh, to reduce tax levy in the nutrition program in 2021. Um, this carryover is only allowed in the 2020 to 2021 year because of the COVID pandemic. Um, the nutrition program isn't able to utilize some of its funding because we've closed the meal sites. And um, there will be some funds remaining in our nutrition program. And the state is allowing us to carry that over into the next year. And so that is one of the ways that we will get to that 120,000 um, reduction in tax levy. So in terms of the placement funds, um, Health and Human Services does not budget for the placement funds. We do not, um, we, we don't set the budget for that. The county board does that. Um, we did, as we presented last month, recommend uh, that the county place an additional $300,000 into the placement funds. And based on expenses, we really recommended that what amount should be in the children's placement fund and what amount should be in the adult placement fund. 
And that's based on our three-year average of roughly $1.3 million in expenses that we've had in placements. Um, at this point, this did not get included in the current version of the 2021 budget. Um, this is, I, I just want to point it out uh, that if it doesn't, uh, we will then stay at that $1 million and continue our efforts um, to reduce our placement expenses. Uh, but the worry, of course, for us is that we've been averaging 1.3 million and that 300,000 would kind of assure that we were covered. Um, so our, that's, that's the risk that the county faces. And then we um, continue to have the same capital request um, to try to address the community services building needs. Uh, that still, um, I believe, is being considered for capital borrowing in the coming years. Uh, for next year, uh, our only request was to set aside uh, enough uh, in capital borrowing that if we have a heating cooling unit fail, that there would be funds to help cover that. So uh, just yesterday, uh, the large uh, department heads had a meeting with our county administrator. Um, at the Finance and Personnel Committee meeting on September 1st, there were some concerns um, expressed for the impact of the, the tax levy reductions on the smaller departments. Um, so yesterday, Clint had uh, directed Health and Human Services and the other uh, large county departments, including Highway, Pine Valley, and the Sheriff's Department, uh, to present to the Finance and Personnel Committee on the impact of making an additional uh, tax levy reduction of $100,000 to each of our budgets. So what I'm presenting with you is the um, $120,000 reduction. We have not been specifically directed to cut another $100,000, but we are being asked to um, be prepared to look at what would that look like in our budget if we had to do that. Um, so at next uh, Wednesday's Finance and Personnel Committee, uh, we'll be prepared to discuss that with the Finance and Personnel Committee. All right, I don't know if you have any questions, but I, I think what I'm presenting to you that already went to the Finance and Personnel Committee is uh, request to have you approve uh, this amended preliminary budget so that this is the current budget that we're operating under. I, I guess there's some potential that we would be asked to make further adjustments that we'd need to bring back to you in October, but this would kind of catch us up to the status that we're at with the Finance and Personnel Committee. Any questions for Tracy? I entertain a motion to approve the amended. I make a motion to approve budget for 2021. Motion by Supervisor I, Calls or a second. Second by Debbie Kaiser. Seconded by Debbie Kaiser. Is there any further discussion? Is that extra hundred thousand going to impact your budget pretty significantly? You assume. Yeah, you know, it, just kind of hearing this yesterday, I haven't had time to wrap my head around it, but um, it was it was it was tricky to get to the hundred and twenty thousand. Um, but I feel pretty good about what we did to try to preserve services and pre and and continue to move forward with some of our plans to try to cover our services better in the community. A um, hundred thousand is a, you know, I, I see Clint is on and please feel free to jump in if, you, if you'd like to, Clint. I, th I think really what we're being asked is to really detail out what the impact would be if, if that's what the decision was. It, it will cause us to lose staff. I, I don't see any other way um, if we have to make that 
level of cuts. I, I guess I want to remind um, our board that last year uh, we agreed to reduce our tax levy in the Health and Human Services budget by $20,000 because we thought we could manage that. Um, and through just an error, uh, it turned out to be $40,000 after we saw what the, you know, what had happened um, in the final numbers. So we've already in the last two years would be seeing $140,000 reduction in tax levy to our budget. Um, it, it, it will be, um, it will be devastating if if that's what ends up happening to add another hundred thousand i don't think that i could have said it better um that's the it, as many of you that were uh, there or tuned into the meeting that we had with finance and personnel there was discussion that did resonate and they wanted to see what more options would look like from uh, essentially bigger squeeze on the bigger departments that are, are relying on levy and trying to preserve uh, functions and peoples from smaller departments. So um, underneath that guidance, as Tracy mentioned, I reached out to her, Roger, and uh, and Jim yesterday, Tom prior to that to see, uh, to understand what the impacts are of going beyond the already cuts that have been established. So I'm, I'm looking for the bigger departments to have allocation of some of the meeting time on Wednesday to further discuss with the committee uh, to help them understand on what the additional impacts would be as they weigh their decisions on the proposed uh, cuts versus uh, the other options that are afforded to them. Is it too late in the game to uh, go and ask for uh, the public for uh raise in our in our levy referendum process um, hinges on two different things uh, getting the net new construction uh, estimate from the Department of Revenues and then we have to get the language and everything put together an appropriate amount of time to be able to put it on the ballot uh, for the election and I don't know what that time limit would look like but trying to maneuver on it uh, now might be a significant challenge I think we're at a point in time at, at the county and I'm this is kind of off subject but we're at a point in time now in the county where I think we need to do that because we're running on budgets from like 2006 and we can't increase it. and the only way we increase them is through borrowing money or reducing and we're at a point now where we're on a budget from like 2006 and everything else is skyrocketed in costs we just can't sustain it. And the state legislature won't budge unless we do a referendum. That's where we're at. We're stuck at it. And I think we're at a point now where we need to ask the taxpayers if we can increase our, our levy. A little bit, not a lot, I would think. But and I think in the end, it's going to help us out because if we keep borrowing money, borrowing money, we're just tacking on 100000 for or $100 for 100000 Every time we borrow money, that's going to add up over time. I think, I don't know, just my opinion. I think we're at, at that point in time now. I don't disagree, and it's something that I certainly plan on looking action to, to coordinate and try to put together. Uh, from what I understand, no county has successfully put together a referendum that's went through for general operating levy, um, but there has been uh, different levy things that have went together to that have uh, folks have worked through for specific projects. I'm thinking back to my most recent experience with Green County. They put together operational levy specific to their uh, nursing home. Um, so there's there's been counties that have been successful in doing referendums, but not any that I'm aware of that has has yet to succeed in getting one through for just general operation levy. But it doesn't mean we can't be the first. We need to explore. I think Mark was right at the last at the last finance personnel meeting, you know, saying that the smaller departments are already at meat and bones. They're already right down to that, and then we're asking them to cut even more. And the reason why we're already at that point is because costs have increased on everything and running everything, and we're still at that budget from whenever that levy freeze was held. 
and nobody wants to budge on that because everybody runs on not raising taxes. Well, they'll be even more pissed if we don't have funding to do all the programs that we offer. Even the ones that are mandated that we have to. Any further discussion? Gary, I have one question. You mentioned borrowing and the amount of interest that's being paid back. Um, how much of an outlay is Richmond County paying on its borrowed money? I mean, I mean, how much money of that, how much of that money could be retained here in the county if we didn't have that, if we didn't have to borrow? Well, that one, Clint, I don't. Part of the mechanisms of what we do with the borrowing is we're able to circumvent uh, some of the, I shouldn't say circumvent, the legislation's kind of put in line where you can't raise your le levy limit unless it's hooked to a formula to our net new construction improvements to our properties. Um, so the other thing that you can do though is that you can raise levy for, for debt and for general obligation type of a debt. So what we've continued to do is push more capital improvements, uh, capital projects, things that can be borrowed for uh, legally by, uh, by legislation into loan types of things in order to free up that, you know, the, the space we have on the ceiling for our operational levy. So we're almost kind of forced to borrow for uh, buying buildings and, and equipment for the sake of being able to have an operation levy for uh, for continued wages and salaries and, and other types of expenses like that. If that answers your question. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we do have a motion in a second it to approve our preliminary budget. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carried. Moving on to agenda item number 19, adjournment. I'll make a motion for us to be adjourned until November or October. October? October 8th, I believe. October 8th. I make a motion to adjourn. I second the motion. To motion adjourned. by Pay Cost, seconded by Debbie Kaiser. Is 10.30 an appropriate time for everybody? Or do you want to see it later in the afternoon? So um, I know I was the one who mentioned this last time that it may not work as well based on my schedule. But now I have my schedule. It does work well for me. Um, with the Zoom meeting, so I get done teaching at like 10, 20, have to run home and set up for Zoom. Um, so just an FYI, I may show up to some meetings a little bit late because of that. Today I was able to make it. But. Alrighty. Board members, go approve your invoices or reply to the email. Yeah. You. Send your email back to Robin for approval. Thank you, guys. All those in favor of adjourning. One other thing, uh, we just want to remind people, per diems haven't always been coming back. So I've been mailing them out. Now Megan's mailing them out um, and with return postage paid envelopes. If you want to get paid for attending the meetings, you got to sign that and return it back to us. So we're missing a few. Just a reminder. Any further reminders, discussions? All those in favor of adjourning the meeting till October 8th, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you everybody for attending our meeting today. Thank you. Bye. Aye. 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 Aye.